So welcome to the seminar of the Sony Asseni Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Today our speakers is Nirmal Jariam. He comes from Stanford. He got his PhD very recently. Uh, something about him. He comes from India, from Madras, where he got his degree from IIT Madras. I think his score was pretty high, 954 out of 10, which has put him at the top of his class. Then he went to Stanford, got his MS in statistics, and uh, then his PhD in civil engineering under the uh, leadership of Professor Jack Baxter, who was here to give us a talk about, I think it was about a, less than a year ago. Uh, something about him, this young man was able to defeat the 4.0 since his GPA at Stanford was 4.08 and 4.09. Okay, so he is a straight A plus. <laughs> Not an A, but an A plus fellow. Okay, I want you to know. So we are very pleased to have Nirmal with us today and he's going to talk about probabilistic seismic lifeline risk assessment using efficient sampling and data reduction technique. Nirmal, the floor is yours. So thank you, Professor Bardi, for your very kind introduction, and thanks for having me here. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about probabilistic seismic lifeline risk assessment using efficient sampling and data reduction techniques. Uh, most of my talk is going to be focused on what I worked on uh, as a doctoral student at Stanford, and I'm also going to talk a little bit towards the end about where we are heading forward with this work and uh, kind of talk about areas of contribution for the future. So just to give a very brief introduction about what lifelines are, Lifelines basically denote large geographically distributed uh, infrastructure systems. And you could think of examples such as transportation networks, or power distribution networks, and so on and so forth, which are not located at any particular site, but rather are spread over a large geographic area. So we've seen in the past that lifelines are really important for the uh, well-being of a society, but they tend to be vulnerable uh, during earthquakes and other hazards. Just to give a quick example, there were millions of billions of dollars of losses ascribed to power and transportation failure during the 1994 Northridge earthquake right here. And uh, it kind of tells us why it's important for us to carry out uh, risk assessments of these lifelines due to potential uh, earthquake and other hazards in the future, and think about what we can do to mitigate some of these hazards. So that's kind of the, what the goal of this particular uh, work is. Just to give a big picture introduction about what uh, risk assessment currently is in terms of uh, the PBEE methodology, which refers to performance-based earthquake engineering. Uh, it is one of the common tools that's being used these days to estimate the risk of single structures in a, in a probabilistic uh, framework. And what we typically do is, let's say we want to assess the risk of this particular building to earthquakes. The first thing we try to do is to quantify the different earthquake ground motions that could happen in the future at this particular location. Because that's going to determine how the building performs. And a lot of times, this is done using this framework called probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, which basically tells us the probabilities of observing different levels of ground motions at this particular, uh, particular site. The second thing we do is, well, now we know about the ground motions. We look at how the structure performs uh, due to these ground motions. And that's where the structural analysis uh, comes in. Now we know how the structure behaves. We can try and quantify the damage states of the different structures. You could think of uh, whether a structure would collapse due to the ground motion or whether there would just be minor or major damage, and so on and so forth. So that's the third step. And once we've quantified what happens to the structure, we can look at our performance measures. A lot of times, uh, there are three Ds, dollar, deaths, and downtimes. And that's what we are interested in looking at. And uh, we, are, we are interested in looking at various possible values of these performance functions uh, during the future. So while those are the four individual components, we kind of put them together a lot of times using uh, numerical integration to obtain uh, the exceedance rates of different uh, performance measures. In other words, what's the chance you'd observe like a million dollar loss and things like that. While that kind of told us how to carry out the risk for a single structure, uh, risk assessment for lifelines is actually slightly less straightforward. And what are the reasons for that? 
This particular figure shows a representation of the San Francisco Bay Area transportation network. And uh, what you see here are two green circles, which, which basically represent two different bridges located in the network. And if we want to see how the network performs to earthquakes, we need to locate uh, what have we need to identify what happens to the individual bridges first, and which means we are no longer interested in looking at ground motions at just a single site. We are interested in looking at ground motions over this entire region. So now we have ground motions at bridge one, ground motion at bridge two, and so on and so forth. So that's an added layer of complexity uh, than what we saw in the previous case. And that's a lot of my talk is actually going to be focusing on how we handle uh, this particular complication. Well, once we've quantified the ground motion at multiple locations that are of interest to us, we could, we could go ahead and say, hey, well, what happens to the bridge due to the ground motions? Well, again, the same thing as we did for the buildings. And finally, we can look at how the network performs, or the system performs, uh, due to this particular ground motion hazard. And for example, for the transportation network, you could look at congestion uh, as an example. Like what, what levels of travel time delays uh, can be expected due to an earthquake in the Bay Area for this particular sample. And uh, th then again, you need to put them all together. And our final risk measure would be the exceed and probability of exceedance of different levels of uh, travel time delays in this particular case. So to address them one by one, I first want to talk about how we quantify the ground motion hazard at just a single site uh, first. And that's based on the probabilistic seismic hazard analysis framework, like I mentioned previously. The first thing we do is source characterization. What are the different uh, sources of earthquakes in the region? This just shows some of those major faults in the San Francisco Bay Area. The second thing is ground motion characterization. Well, you know the sources. Now we need to look at the ground motions. And by ground motion, a lot of times we refer to the entire time history or the acceleration time history. But many times, we also look at what are called intensity measures. You could think of peak ground acceleration as one example, or the spectral acceleration, which is the maximum acceleration of this SDOF oscillator corresponding to a period t. These are some summary measures of ground motion intensities or how strong the ground motion is. And we can try to quantify uh, how the spectral acceler how, what kind of spectral accelerations we can expect uh, due to future earthquakes. In this particular work, I'm primarily focused on using intensity measures, uh, not the entire time histories. So uh, first of all, how do we then quantify uh, the, how the intensity measures uh, occur during a particular earthquake? A lot of times, this is done stochastically or probabilistically using what's called a ground motion model, or formally called attenuation equation. This figure, for example, shows the spectral accelerations at a half a second recorded during the 1999 Chichi earthquake and how it varies over distance. And you see that uh, there is a central line passing through, which is basically a mean estimate of what the ground motions are. And there's a lot of scatter about it. So overall, when we try to predict ground motions, we have two things to try and predict. What are the mean ground motions that we can expect you know, during a particular earthquake? And then what, are the, what is the scatter about the mean ground motion? We need to try and quantify both. So the ground motion model basically does that. It says the intensity at a particular site is a function of this mean term. And the mean is a function of, say, the earthquake magnitude, how far the site is away from the fault, t, and so on and so forth. And that's just the mean term, which you see in the blue line. And then there's this error term here which basically uh, corresponds to the scatter you see about the mean. There are two different types of error terms, denoted epsilon and eta here. This eta is called the inter-event residual. You could, the inter-event residual is basically a constant term across the whole earthquake. So what it basically says is, for a particular earthquake, the ground motions at all the sites are above average or below average. So in some sense, the eta is a property of the earthquake, could be positive or negative. The epsilon, on the other hand, is that component of the error which actually varies from site to site. So that's more like a site property. Like at this particular site, could be more than the mean, could be less than the mean. And we need to look at the mean term here, the epsilon, the eta, all three together in order to quantify the ground motion hazard at any particular site. Now, if we want to do the same thing at, uh, at multiple sites, for example, two sites, I and J, as shown in this figure, we can, we can repeat the ground motion model corresponding to sites i and j, but there's an added level of complexity here. What happens is these two terms are no longer independent of each other. Empirically, it's been observed that this residual term, epsilon i and epsilon j, which is the error term at sites i and j, are actually correlated. So think about it. Let's say we have two sites i and j close to each other. At one site, if the ground motion is above the mean, 
at a very close by site, you can expect the ground motion to be above the mean as well. And similarly, if one site has a below mean ground motion, the other site has a below mean ground motion as well. So that basically implies that there is a correlation between epsilon i and epsilon j, and that depends on the distance between i and j. Talk about it in more detail. This figure first shows uh, the PGA residuals, how the epsilon terms computed from the Chi-Chi earthquake data. And what you see are clusters here of large valued residuals and then clusters of small valued residuals. And that's kind of indicative of this correlation. What it says is the residuals end up being uh, clustered together uh, when, uh, whenever the sites are, um, for sites are close to each other, the, the residuals end up being close to each other as well. There are many physical reasons why the spatial correlation actually occurs. I listed some examples here. Common source effects, it's basically the same earthquake causing the ground motion, tends to push it up or down in two different sites uh, the same way. Similar location to asperities, which kind of emit more of the energy, and uh, sites close to asperities would end up having larger ground motion intensities. Similar wave propagation paths. If two sites are close by, the propagation paths are similar, causing this correlation as well. And similar local site effects, which we don't completely capture sometimes in ground motion models, and that could set up uh, some amount of correlation as well. So overall, there is a correlation which like, physically makes sense, and it's also been empirically observed. And in order to quantify these regional ground motions, we need to first understand uh, how the correlation behaves. And uh, that's what we first focused on, is basically try and estimate this correlation uh, from empirical data or recorded data. Ideally, if we want to estimate the correlation between the residuals at sites i and j, if we have 100 recordings and 100 recordings here, it's fairly easy to get the correlation. But that's never going to happen in practice, because you're not going to have 100 earthquake recordings at sites and j, uh, i and j together. We actually make a couple of assumptions in order to get over this problem. The first assumption is called stationarity. Now what it says is any pair of sites with the same separation during an earthquake has the same correlation. Now what it means is if I take sites i and j and just move them along the grid anywhere, they still have the same correlation. That's, it's just a property or a function of the distance uh, of the separation, not the actual location. The second assumption is called isotropy which basically says that the correlation is not a function of the azimuth. So in other words, if I take sites i and j and rotate them, the correlation doesn't change. It still remains the same. So with these two assumptions, we can actually now estimate correlations. And how would we do that? Let's assume that we want to estimate the correlation between two sites i and j, which are separated by distance h. Now, Instead of just looking at two sites which are separated by distance h, we could pick all pairs of sites with the same separation distance because they all have the same correlation. And that comes from the assumptions of stationarity and isotropy. So what we do then is look for all pairs of sites in this grid that are separated roughly by distance h, and then we can plot them in the scatter plot like that. So that's like epsilon at the first site, epsilon at the second site, where the two sites are separated by distance h. Well, now we can actually estimate the correlation, which wasn't possible earlier. But we need to remember that this correlation is only valid for separation distance h. But of course, we can use different separation distances and compute this correlation. This particular figure shows 1 minus the correlation as a function of that h. 1 minus correlation comes from standard geostatistical conventions. And you see that the correlation when the separation is 0 tends to be 1, which makes sense, because the sites are really close, so they end up behaving very similar to each other. And when they're very far away, like 50 or more kilometers apart, uh, you see that the correlation basically dies down. So very far away sites tend to behave in an uncorrelated manner, which again has an intuitive meaning as well. Now, but in order to have any use, we need to try and fit some kind of a model through it so that we can use it for uh, predictive purpose later. We chose this exponential decay form, which actually shows that the correlation has an exponential decay with the separation. And the rate of decay is controlled by this parameter R, also called the range parameter. Physically, what the range means is, is the distance at which the correlation nearly dies down to 0. That's the physical interpretation of range. But mathematically, if we know this particular value of range, we know everything about the spatial correlation. So all we need to do is to estimate the, estimate the value of range. And how would we do that? Well, you could do something like a least square spread through it and estimate the value of range from that. Uh, there are some minor details there, but that's, the, that's kind of the big picture. One other thing to note right here is a large value of R, which is a large range, implies more correlation. Because if I pull this further, you're going to see a, a larger correlation generally. So large range implies large correlation. Small range implies a smaller correlation. <coughs> 
So two examples here. The range computed for different spectral acceleration periods from the 1994 Northridge earthquake and the 1999 Chichi earthquake. There are a couple of things to observe. First, in both cases, there is a general trend where the range increases with the period. Well, that kind of makes sense because the long period ground motion components typically tend to be less affected by local heterogeneities, like small scale variations. So the long period component typically ends up showing a larger value of correlation as well. That's kind of the physical meaning for that. The second observation is that the, at short periods, below something like, let's say, one second, the north, north earthquake, the correlation dies down. The range dies down, which means the correlation dies down too. And here, the correlation actually shoots up, corresponding to the PGA. That was puzzling for us, and we wanted to try and explain that. But before that, this particular figure um, shows the range across for the different periods, corresponding to seven different earthquakes. So again, the same things to see. There's a lot of scatter uh, in the plots, something to expect. But there's a general trend of increase in the correlation of the period, as we saw with the Chichi and the Northridge earthquakes. In the same trend at chart periods, there are a few earthquakes where the correlation sort of dies down, and a few earthquakes where the correlation kind of goes up at chart periods. We looked at various possible explanations for that, and our hypothesis is that these are actually related to the, to the VS30s, or the average shear wave velocities at the sites. So, Basically, what we found is whenever the correlation kind of goes up, the region was homogeneous in terms of the shear wave velocities. Now, why does that make sense? If you have a region that's kind of homogeneous in terms of shear wave velocities, the local site effects tend to sort of behave similarly as well. And if you have an error in predicting it at one site, it tends to repeat itself at a nearby site. Whereas if the region is undulating in terms of, uh, in terms of the VS30, the local side effects get like, all scattered, and then, and then the correlation structure ends up breaking down. So that was our hypothesis for why uh, the correlations tend to behave differently over there. So with that in mind, we fitted this model for regression, uh, for correlation based on the numbers I showed you in the previous slide. So we have a separate case when the soil is clustered, a separate case when it's unclustered, and then we have a single uh, prediction for, for the long periods. So this is basically our spatial correlation model, which we now use for predicting regional ground motions. Question is, yeah. for your VS30, what range of VS30 did you use? Uh, did you t uh, cut it off like a 30, 300 meters per second or higher, or you included soft soils? We included soft soils. Ah. So you were looking uh, we at the site response, not the outcrop. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. looking at including a lot of dispersion due to the soft soils. Uh, the thing is, some of that dispersion is already captured by the ground motion models. Yeah. Because the ground motion model predicts the mean using the VS30 values. So the nonlinear amplifications due to the soft soil kind of already goes into the ground motion model. Yeah. What we see here is, a, is the dispersion beyond it, beyond what's predicted. Yeah, these models have not been calibrated for low shear wave velocity. Exactly. So you need to reach anything below uh, even uh, 400 meters per second should not be included. Okay. Okay, I mean, it, yeah, makes sense. This is in some sense a correction for that. He's talking about it in a way. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, if, if you basically have, that, that's the thing. So if you have a region where all this basically have something like a basin, and then you don't really predict it, the correlation kind of goes in and, and then says, well, we have this error, but it's kind of similar at all the sites, and, and, and then goes back in. But you're right. I mean, if you, if you were able to predict that component accurately, then this correlation would actually die down. Because now everything is already getting captured by the ground motion model, and there is no residual uncertainty about it, which, is, which causes this correlation. So things could improve if the ground motion model improves. It's a good point, though. So one other thing that I just, I'm going to briefly mention is, is that I, I made these assumptions of stationarity and isotropy, which helped us compute these correlations. But how do we know if they are true? And the problem is, the theoretically, we can actually, uh, actually verify those assumptions, but you need a lot of data, which is never really available uh, with recorded ground motions. So what we then did is to look at uh, physical simulations of ground motions that were provided to us by Dr. Brad Eggert from the USGS. And for example, this particular figure shows 40,000 spectral acceleration recordings for corresponding to the 1906 earthquake. And with this huge grid, now we've actually went about uh, verifying some of these finer assumptions of stationary and isotropy. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but if anyone's interested in learning more, I would love to talk about it after the talk. In general, we found in most circumstances, the assumptions are uh, reasonably stable. Well, so going back to this big picture slide about the lifeline risk assessment, all I've talked so far 
is how do we quantify these regional ground motions in terms of the spatial correlations? We still have to go forward and look at actual lifeline performance. And that's what the rest of the talk is basically going to be focused on. So first of all, this, one of the things about lifeline risk assessment as against uh, risk assessment over a single structure is that Monte Carlo simulation-based techniques are commonly used. And a lot of work, uh, significant work, has been done right here at USC by Professor James Moore and also by Professor Shane Azuka in the past. What these simulation-based techniques do is you look at various probable future earthquakes and the corresponding ground motions. And then you see how the lifeline performs under each of those simulated scenarios. And then you kind of make your decisions based on those simulations. But the problem is the basic Monte Carlo approach is highly computationally intensive. There are two reasons why. One. With a basic Monte Carlo approach, we need to simulate a lot of different possible scenarios. In, in our case, we found we needed close to like a million scenarios of simulations for obtaining very robust estimates of, of lifeline risk. And the second problem is lifeline performance assessment is usually computationally intensive. So there is no way we are going to be able to evaluate the performance of lifeline a million times in a lot of cases. So we wanted to improve the basic Monte Carlo framework in order to bring down this computational intensity. And we do that by using two ideas of efficient sampling and data reduction. So I'm going to talk about it in more detail. First of all, just to go back to the basic Monte Carlo approach, how would, how would we do use the conventional or basic approach to do that? It's based on this form of the ground motion equation. As I mentioned previously, the intensity is predicted in terms of a mean parameter and the uncertainty terms about the mean. If you just take an exponent of that, the intensity is predicted as this exponential of the mean, uh, which actually is the median statistically. So this term here is the median prediction times the exponential of the residuals. So if we know this term here, and if we know this term here, we can actually obtain a simulation for the ground motions. So for example, this fault here is the San Andreas fault. And we assume that a magnitude 8 earthquake has happened on the San Andreas fault. And we are interested in, uh, in simulating one realization of ground motions. At, at, uh, over the entire Bay Area. So how would we go about doing that? The first thing is to look at the median predictions. So that's this particular figure. It shows the median predictions, and we get that directly from the ground motion models that I talked about previously. The second thing is this term here, exponential of the residuals. So we simulated a bunch of residuals using our spatial correlation model that I talked about in the previous slide. And then you just multiply them together in order to obtain uh, the final set of ground motions uh, corresponding to this particular rupture. Of course, you can do this multiple times. You could simulate different sets of magnitudes on different faults, and you could simulate several sets of uh, residuals. And you can combine them together in order to obtain multiple such ground motion maps. So that's kind of the idea of Monte Carlo. Repeat this procedure multiple times, obtain many, many such maps, and look at how the lifeline performs under each of those maps. So. Just to kind of uh, explain it differently, this particular figure shows four of those simulated maps. If you just pick any one site here, and then look at the spectral accelerations of the simulations, and you plot them in this figure in this form, this particular figure shows the probability of exceeding different values of spectral acceleration at one site. It actually matches what we would get from probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, which is done analytically. So in other words, what all this, this slide says here is, our simulation is basically the same as the numerical way which is currently done for single structures, except we are also keeping track of the correlations, which is currently not done when you look at numerical simulations of this. So it's very similar to probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, perhaps more generalized than that. OK. So now that we have a bunch of ground motion maps, we can actually look at uh, estimating the performance of a lifeline. In our case, we chose the sample lifelines, the San Francisco Bay Area Transportation Network. Uh, we are interested in looking at travel time delays that are induced by earthquakes in the future on this network. We got the network data, origin destination demands originally from Caltrans. Uh, the original network actually is fairly complicated in the sense it has over 10,000 nodes and 20,000 links, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, large network. Doing a risk assessment on that network is possible using some of the efficient sampling ideas that I'm going to talk about. But there's no way we can use a Monte Carlo to compute the risk of, uh, of such a complicated network. But if we can't do the Monte Carlo, how would we compare our results? It's not going to be possible. So what we decided to do is to take this actual network sh like shown as uh, inside as shown there and kind of aggregate it to obtain a sort of equivalent but 
a network with fewer nodes and links that primarily consists of freeways, and we were looking at the risk assessment for the simpler network uh, instead of the actual network. Well, and if you want to estimate the performance of network due to earthquakes, the first thing we need to do is to find out how the bridges perform during earthquakes. And the bridge damage states are estimated using hazard fragility functions. Uh, we obtain travel times on this network during normal conditions as well as in damage conditions using uh, the standard user equilibrium model. There are a number of simplifications in this model. But the primary idea here is to try and illustrate how our risk assessment framework and if desired, we can always go ahead and change some of these components that kind of go into it in order to obtain a more uh, r robust uh, transportation network model. When you travel time when you compute them, are you using an origin destination matrix? Yeah, we are. So you have this feature, mm -hmm. so you assume that. Yes. Given to you, okay. Yes. Uh, we get that from, again, from Caltrans. So you so. assume that origin destination matrix doesn't change. Exactly. So that's one of the assumptions there. We use this fixed demand model where we assume that there are already pairs don't change after the earthquake, which is probably not true. So that, that's one of the simplifications that we used. OK, now, so for this particular network, how would we carry out a risk assessment? So I mentioned that we have uh, four of these simulations. So we can go back and see how the lifeline performs under each of those maps. So under this particular map, this is how the lifeline performs in the sense the lines that are shown in red basically corresponding to the roads or the links where you see large travel time delays. And the ones in yellow show medium travel time delays, and the greens are basically where you didn't see much travel time delay. So in other words, you can actually look at the damaged conditions and see how people are getting delayed due to that particular earthquake. And we kind of aggregate them together by summing up the travel time delay for each user in the network. So in other words, we know the travel time delay in each road. We kind of pull them all together in order to obtain this overall network travel time delay which is kind of our measure, a performance measure of, of interest. Three different figures show travel time delays corresponding to three other earthquake scenarios. We can do this for all the earthquake scenarios that we simulated using Monte Carlo. And we can pull them all together to obtain what's called the exceedance curve, which basically shows what is the annual rate of exceedance of our different values of travel time delays. So, and again, Small values of travel time delays get exceeded with a larger rate, so it's pretty much intuitive there. But the, this is basically the, the risk measure that is of interest to us. I mentioned pre at the beginning that we are interested in looking at what are the probabilities or the rates of exceeding different values of travel time delays. And this figure shows that. Is this realistic? You're showing numbers which are 20,000 hours, which is in terms of how many months are you talking about? OK, so uh, that's, that's another modeling thing here. So we I'm do this only for. Traffic for two days, I mean, more than a month. Yeah. I'll die there. Oh, this is the overall travel time delay. So for, all uh, for all the okay, users. Good. All <laughs> the users. <laughs> good. We are all right. Very good. Okay. <laughs> we need to normalize that maybe by the number of users. Yeah, that'll be a good idea. The average so travel time delay. Uh, you know, this population will be delayed so many minutes. Makes sense. Here, I, sorry, I <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so this is our um, risk measure of interest. But we got here using this basic Monte Carlo approach. Now, it took us a week to actually come up with this particular curve. Even for an aggregated network that I showed in the figure, there's no way we can do this for a realistic network with a larger number of nodes and links. So then we wanted to improve the performance computationally. And this is, again, based on the two ideas that I talked about previously. The first thing is preferentially sample interesting events using important sampling. Or I'm going to talk about it in more detail, but what we are saying here is don't simulate all possible earthquakes that could happen in the future. Let's simulate the ones uh, which might control the, the risk curve in more, more detail. The second idea here, here is to replace similar ground motion maps with a single representative map. So what it says here is, if you have if you simulated like 1,000 maps, but like 500 of them look similar to the other 500, you don't need to use all 1,000. You could just use 500. So that's kind of the two big ideas that kind of go into how we improve the efficiency of this analysis. In more detail, the first thing we simulate when we do we simulate our ground motion maps is the magnitude. And this shows a typical distribution of our probability density function for the magnitude. And you would see, that, as you would expect, small magnitude events have a larger probability of occurrence in practice. But what this means for us is that if we do a Monte Carlo sampling, we'll end up sampling a large number of small magnitude events. 
But from a risk assessment point of view, we are not just interested in small magnitudes. We are also interested basically over here. It's like what happens to the network when large magnitude earthquakes happen? So what we want to do is to not sample a lot from here and sample very few from here. We want to have more samples from here than what we would get from just a basic Monte Carlo approach. And, and how would we do that? We basically partition this whole range of magnitudes into multiple smaller partitions. We then select one magnitude from each partition. It actually does a couple of things for us. One, we end up sampling over the entire range of interest by sampling one from each partition. But secondly, we actually also sample quite a lot from here, basically by having smaller partition widths over there. So in other words, there's a twofold benefit. We sample all magnitudes of interest, but we sample preferentially the large magnitudes, which kind of control the hazard. Now, but we need to account for the fact that this is not natural, something artificial that we've created. And you can do that statistically by using this important sampling weight. So sort of think of it as a correction factor for whatever sampling we've done. But if you apply this factor, you'd get completely unbiased estimates of the, of the risk. And you could do something similar for the residuals as well. As you might remember, I mentioned the residuals are the epsilons and the etas, which get added to the mean. They follow a normal distribution, which is centered on 0. And if you sample from here, you would end up sampling a lot of residuals close to the mean, which is 0. But again, from a risk assessment point of view, we are interested in looking at what's happening when large ground motions happen. That's basically from the tail of this distribution. So in order to preferentially sample from the tail, we sample from this shifted normal distribution. We just take this original normal distribution and push it forward, and we sample it from there, which will lead to more samples from the tail of the distribution. So in any case, what we saw here is that we could do this for both the inter event residual and the intra event residuals. And we have an overall computational expense reduction of about two orders of magnitude. I'll talk more about this later, but that's, that's quite significant. OK, so that brought us down by a two orders of magnitude. We started off from a million, came down to 10,000, big deal. 10,000 is still a lot. So we actually wanted to do more. And that's where the second idea kind of kicks in. We said, let's, OK, let's assume that we have these four maps here, which were simulated for four different earthquakes on four different faults, and so on and so forth. But we could say, hey, well, these two maps kind of look similar. We'll talk about what similarity means. But if they are similar, we really don't need to analyze the performance under each of those maps. You just need to pick one map and throw away the other, because the lifeline is probably going to perform similar in, under both those conditions as well. So what we then do here is we take our 10,000 odd maps, and then we cluster them, or we pu put them together based on similarity into something like 100 or 150 clusters. We then need only one map from each of those clusters. So we have, at the end of the day, we have 150 maps which are sort of dissimilar from each other. And we can use that for our lifeline risk assessment. Are these clusters related to the fault mechanism? We don't, we, the clusters are purely based on the ground motion intensities. They don't look at the magnitudes. They don't look at the falls. That's kind of the benefit of this procedure, is you could combine two events happening on two different falls with two different magnitudes, but still uh, which end up producing similar uh, ground motion intensities. So basically, there must be some well, uh, origin. There must be so the fault must be somewhat contributing to clustering the data. It, it certainly will be contributing, but it's, it's, not, it's not constrained to. That's the, that's the idea. Like you could, for example, have a lower, smaller magnitude event with larger residuals getting pulled in with a large magnitude, smaller residuals. That's kind of the idea that's coming in there. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and similarity is mathematically measured uh, as the Euclidean distance between these two maps here. So that's, that's how we mathematically do this clustering. And we use this k-means algorithm, uh, algorithm to do it. Well, so we started out from a million. The important sampling brought us to something like 10,000. The clustering brought us to something like 100. So overall, we actually have four orders of reduction in the number of maps that we need. The question is, does it work? And is the lifeline performance actually getting assessed well by these 100, 100 or 150 maps uh, rather than the million Monte Carlo maps? So to answer that question, the blue curve here shows the exceedance curve for the travel time delays obtained using a basic Monte Carlo approach. The red line shows the important sampling uh, results. And you see that the important sampling curve and the Monte Carlo curve pretty much lie on top of each other. Using other statistical tests, too, we didn't find too much difference. But then we got a 100 times uh, reduction in the number of samples we need. So it's, it's quite uh, significant in that sense, and it's still accurate. Each of those gray lines 
have been ob obtained after data reduction, after clustering. So what we did is we took this important sampling and then did clustering many, many times and then had like multiple sets of 150 maps. We then looked at the performance of the lifeline uh, under each of those 150 maps and we plotted these gray curves. The reason why I plotted them is to basically show that when we do use the 150 maps, there is some amount of variability in our final results. But then it's something that we need to expect. 150 maps is way smaller than a million, so it obviously increases the variance a little bit. But we need to note that for the 10 to the 4 magnitude uh, or reduction in the number of maps, this variance might actually be reasonable. The other thing to note here is that these gray lines are sort of evenly spread around those curves. What it means mathematically is that, is that the results are unbiased. And we even showed that theoretically that this whole procedure uh, does not cause any bias in our estimates of the risk. So we did all this, uh, the k-means and, and so on and so forth, because we wanted to capture the correlation. We wanted to capture the uncertainties. A lot of people still in practice kind of use deterministic ground motions. In other words, they sort of ignore the epsilon and the eta. They just use the median prediction, which shown in this particular figure. Does that work? I mean, do we, do we, can, can we just use this, or do we need to add the residual and get this particular map? In order to answer the question, we repeated the risk analysis. Uh, assuming that the residuals are basically equal to zero. We get this black line uh, shown in the figure, and the blue line is actually what we got cons considering the residuals. There is a fair amount of difference uh, between the two cases, especially in the tail. It kind of shows that if you want to model the tail well, you can't just ignore uh, the uncertainty about the, about the median predictions. So we need to capture that. For this particular network, we even notice that when you ignore the spatial correlations, you sort of get this red line, which is somewhere in between, but it's not completely lying on top of the, of the benchmark curve. So it shows that it's important to actually consider both the, mag both the uncertainties as well as the spatial correlations in order to compute uh, the tail ri risks of the lifeline uh, sort of accurately. Uh, they would probably be the ones for corresponding to large magnitudes and large residuals. Yeah, there, I, I, we actually did some de-aggregation. Maybe it, it might be interesting to talk about it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, one thing we did is basically look into the cluster and then look at the travel times corresponding to each map in the cluster. And we generally found that the variance is low for, and the means sort of dissimilar across the different clusters. So, oops, not that. Okay. I, okay. So, for example, when we looked at within a cluster, we computed the mean travel time as well as the variance in the travel time. And this is done by random clustering. Just randomly take the important sampling max, put them in a different cluster. It's kind of the not smart way of doing it. Here you see that the variance is basically high, obviously, because each, each map within a cluster is sort of like dissimilar. But here the variance is generally low. There's a, uh, oh, this shows the variance, sorry. So this is the variance obtained by k-means clustering. This is the variance obtained by like random clustering. What it kind of shows is the k-means has succeeded in, in making sure that within a cluster, the travel times are sort of similar. So we are not going to lose much by, by throwing them out. OK. So this might also answer some of the, one of the questions. What we did is one of the things that our simulation-based framework sort of allows us to do is to kind of uh, do a de-aggregation calculation. De-aggregation is commonly done for hazard in order to find out what earthquakes sort of contribute to the hazard in different regions. We did something similar to find out what earthquakes contribute to different levels of losses for the lifeline. So we did a de-aggregation identifying the different faults as well as the different magnitudes that, that kind of contribute to the loss. And we did that for different levels of loss, in our case, delays. For very small levels of delays, the main contribution is by the San Andreas fault at magnitude 5 earthquake. Kind of makes sense, small event, small losses. When we do this here, we have a large magnitude 8 earthquake. It's kind of doing most of the contribution, which again makes sense. I think the interesting observation here as for inter intermediate levels of delays, you see that the, the Hayward fault here and the San Andreas fault have sort of similar contributions to the delays. What does it imply for us from a risk assessment point of view? In practice, a lot of times, people use a single contributing sort of earthquake for carrying out risk assessments. Now, this figure here shows 
that this contributing earthquake can actually change depending on where you're looking at, what levels of delays you're looking at. And secondly, there are occasions where there are multiple earthquakes kind of contributing, so you can't just pick one event. Basically, this just tries to say why we need to go through this process and, and try to identify all the possible uh, contributing sort of scenarios uh, to our earthquake, to our delays. Well, that pretty much summarizes some of the stuff we worked on so far. Uh, I just thought it would be interesting for to talk for the next five or ten minutes about why we are trying to head forward with this work. And um, the first thing I, I wanted to talk about in this particular regard is ground motion map selection in OpenSHA. Like some of you might be aware, but OpenSHA is a, is a, is a USGS kick initiative uh, for creating an open source program can do a variety of seismic hazard and risk calculations. And one of the ideas for us is basically to try and put in our, our algorithm for, for the map selection into OpenSHA. It has a twofold benefit. One, we end up contributing to OpenSHA, and, but, the, but the other thing is it also makes our algorithm more accessible to the public. So if you're a risk analyst, you want to compute the risk for uh, the LA transportation network, you could kind of go into OpenSHA and select a set of 150 maps and do your risk calculation. And what enables us to do it is this OpenSHA app called the Event Set Data Calculator. When a user selects a bunch of sites and intensity measures, for example, there could be bridge locations in Los Angeles. This Event Set Data Calculator gives us an exhaustive catalog of earthquakes that could actually affect these sites of interest. So in other words, this is, this is an exhaustive catalog of earthquakes based on standard USGS seismicity models and tells us, well, magnitude 6 earthquake on some fault with certain probability will happen and things like that. And based on whatever I talked about previously, the first thing we simulate is this, the magnitude and the faults. And what this allows us to do is to use this exhaustive catalog provided to us by OpenSHA rather than having to do the seismicity simulation ourselves. And everything else sort of follows the same way. We take this catalog provided to us, we carry out efficient sampling data reduction, and provide the small catalog of ground motion maps, which can then be used for a variety of, of infrastructure uh, risk assessment calculations. I should mention at the stage that some of this work, uh, particularly the spatial correlation work, is, uh, is already getting implemented in, in OpenSHA and GM, which is Global Earthquake Model. It's another uh, Global Earthquake Risk Assessment Initiative. And uh, what we're trying to do here is to take it one step further and also enable users to kind of select those 150 maps, which are, which are the representative of the hazard in the region. One thing I did mention in the previous slide is that the user can select a wide, uh, different intensity measures. I didn't talk about this in detail, but the spatial correlation model that we developed only works when the same intensity measure is of interest at all the sites. So in other words, let's say somebody is interested in PGA at all the sites, you could directly use our spatial correlation model. But it does not provide the correlation between two different types of intensity measures. So just to give an example, this figure shows the one second and two second spectral accelerations during the Chi-Chi earthquake. Our correlation model provides us correlations in this figure and in this figure, but it does not provide the cross correlations between those two different types of figures. There are a number of applications where we need these cross correlations. To think of an example, a lot of times we are interested in looking at different types of uh, ground motion hazards like liquefaction and, and, and then ground shaking. And they may be quantified using two different types of intensity measures, like PGA and spectral acceleration at two seconds. So we are no longer interested in just a single IM, but in multiple IMs. And, and that is where uh, this cross-correlation model kind of comes in. And that's something that we are actually working on as, as the next priority. It has a number of other applications, like improving shake map predictions and things like that as well. It's not just for modeling multiple types of hazards. I just thought there are, there are a number of practical problems where, uh, where some, of the mod, some of the issues that I talked about kind of come in. I thought I would briefly talk in a couple of slides about how some of the stuff kind of fits in the California High Speed Rail project. I mean, I chose this project particularly because USC is highly active in research, Professor Bardet in particular. Um, so as, as, as you might know, the California High Speed Rail extends from San Diego to Sacramento. There are a number of seismicity-related issues, including the presence of high seismicity zones in LA and in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. There are numerous fault crossings. Uh, it all comes from, uh, the facts come from this particular paper. Um, and uh, there are many possible earthquake hazards to consider. To give us some quick examples, we might look at ground shaking, liquefaction, ground deformation due to fault rupture, many other types of hazards. 
So think a little bit about how we could model some of the system. The high-speed rail is a lifeline in the sense it's a, it's a linear spatially distributed system. You could sort of think model it as a system with components in series. You could think of each component as a discretized portion of a rail track, or, or it could be like two different or passes on the rail, uh, and so on and so forth. And we are interested in answering a number of questions, like what is the probability of system failure? Which comes from what is the probability at least one of these components fail? It's going to cause system failure. And what is the chance that a component fails due to any of the considered hazards? In the sense, what is the chance that the rail line could fail due to either liquefaction or ground motion, and so on and so forth? So again, you see that there's a need to consider multiple IMs as well as consider the performance of components together, just like we did for the Bay Area Transportation Network. Shows why we need to think about correlations and cross-correlations in this context as well. Similarly, for computing downtimes and restoration costs, they obviously increase with the number of failed components. So we need to think about the probability of observing joint failures of different components. Again, where we need to think about joint failures, we need to think about correlations. And, and even here, the 150 maps would directly apply, because we could look at the performance of the high-speed rail in, in during those 150 scenarios, and so on and so forth. So <coughs> it really fits in, not just in this particular project, but in a lot of practical projects in general. So a couple more things I wanted to talk about is, while my talk basically focused so far on pre-earthquake risk assessment, which is what are the possible earthquakes that could happen in the future? What are the, what are the chances that the lifeline would fail in the future? You could also do a post-earthquake risk assessment. There are a lot of interesting questions in a, in a post-earthquake scenario. An earthquake has just happened. What, what is the possible loss due to this earthquake? Can buildings be occupied immediately after an earthquake? Can a lifeline be operated immediately after an earthquake? And things like that. There are a number of problems which you have to answer in order to come up with answers for these questions. I just listed a couple of examples. One is aftershock modeling. It's quite important when you think of like whether we should let people go back into a building after an earthquake. The aftershock hazard could kind of like impact making such a decision. We talked about how correlations are present within a particular earthquake. Then the second question, which is kind of related, is are aftershock ground motions correlated with the main shock ground motions? Makes sense, because of common source and common site effects, you might, at the particular site, the aftershock ground motions may actually be related to the main shock ground motions. So that helps us better predict aftershock ground motions, because we are now drawing information from the main shock. So using some of these ideas, we could actually potentially improve some of the building tagging, lifeline operating decisions, uh, using the correlation sort of uh, thought process. The other common issue that arises a lot of times is, how can we synthesize multiple types of information that we obtain uh, due to a particular earthquake? For example, you could have a bunch of time history recordings uh, at different recording stations. The USGS provides us with uh, modified mortality intensity data immediately after an earthquake. We also have instrumentation on structures, which provides us with structural response. We have remote sensing systems. We have a lot of different types of data. How can we kind of synthesize them together? I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but a lot of times, this is done using this tool called the Bayesian Networks. There are some computational challenges uh, that is uh, associated with it. And there are, so there's currently research going on to handle it. But using some knowledge about the geostatistics, we could actually further reduce some of this computational demand. And that's something I'm going to explore. Anyone interested, I'd love to talk about this in more detail uh, after the presentation. And, and uh, finally, much of this is actually kind of stable across different types of hazards. It doesn't have to be, uh, you, you, just don't, you don't need to do it just for earthquakes. You can do it for so many different types of hazards. Just to kind of give a quick example, we could look at the same sort of framework for quantifying hurricane wind speeds over a region. This figure, for example, shows what I talked about previously. Look at median ground motions, uncertainty in the ground motions. This figure shows the median wind speeds during a hurricane and the uncertainty in those wind speeds. And then you combine them to get a simulated wind speed. So you see that there's almost exact parallel between like hurricane wind speeds and earthquake ground motions. So what does this mean for us? Any of the tools and ideas that I talked about previously actually applies for hurricanes and for many other hazards, like quantification of chloride concentrations over a region for estimating corrosion, so on and so forth. A lot of things we could do for different hazards. And the last thing I want to talk about is my previous four or five slides kind of focused on how we can better model hazards in the future. But we could also do stuff for the in, from the infrastructure point of view. It doesn't just have to be from the hazard point of view. To kind of give a quick example of what I mean, I mentioned that assessing the performance of a lifeline is a computationally challenging job. 
a lot of times you need like optimization kind of frameworks to, to evaluate the performance of life, uh, lifelines. So it's, it's computationally intensive. But what if we somehow develop a simplistic regression relationship between lifeline performance and, and then ground motion intensities? So, what, so if you give me ground motion intensities, I can give you the lifeline performance, like say the travel time delay, using a regression relationship. It's, it's computationally rapid. I mean, you could, you could do a lot of risk calculations in almost no time at all. This is just an example which shows the predicted delays in the barrier transportation network for a for a, from a regression relationship I develop compared to the actual delays. Actual delays take a long time to compute. Regression takes like milliseconds to do, but the predictions are fairly good. So it seems like this particular approach has a lot of potential for, for risk assessments and for a variety of other risk mitigation sort of calculations. And, and finally, I briefly mentioned that we carried out this network aggregation to, to make the process more computationally tractable. Network aggregation is not something that's really new. It's been done in a lot of fields, including transportation network, sensor networks, and, and computer science, and so on and so forth. And if we can do it systematically for infrastructure, that would also save us a lot of computational time. From a risk assessment point of view, I'm interested in questions such as, if we do this, how does act damage in the real network kind of translate to damage in this aggregated network? How can we make decisions on this and kind of like propagate them back to the actual network? Things like that. Uh, in basically, how do you kind of connect those two in terms of performance and decision making? Those are some of the things that are, are interesting probably to look at. So in conclusion, we've studied the problem of estimating the seismic risk of, of spatially distributed lifelines. There are many important challenges, but two primary challenges deal with quantification of ground motions in an over a region rather than at just a single site, and the development of computationally efficient uh, risk assessment frameworks to do it. The, for the handling the first problem of regional ground motions, we've used well-recorded earthquakes to get spatial correlations, kind of helps us quantify ground motions over a region. We handled the second problem using efficient sampling and data reduction to come up with this uh, 150 maps, which can be used for the lifeline risk assessment. There are a number of possible applications and extensions for both pre- and post-disaster risk assessment of a variety of lifelines under a variety of hazards, and I'm hoping to explore uh, many of that in the future. This particular website gives a list of uh, publications that uh, th this particular presentation draws from, so I'll be happy if anyone takes a look and has any questions for me later. That's about it. Thank you so much. <laughs> is there any way, of, or could you perhaps, um, well, it seems that in many cities there is these cameras and other stuff that measure the traffic. Is there any way of measuring the traffic and the associated delays during an earthquake to sort of validate what you did? Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. So the sense that's something that I'm hoping to do, not just using traffic cameras, but also due to during, like using GPS measurements, for example. So I think one thing that has to be calibrated is what Professor Bardet talked about, is how, what happens to the origin destination demands immediately after an earthquake. There's some amount of research into what happens there, but with, with so, much, so many GPSs available on the road, we should be able to collect more precise information to see how that uh, kind of varies before and after an earthquake and kind of update some of these models. So uh, yeah, that's definitely a very, very good idea. They approximate models. The origin destinations, you understand, you create districts, little areas, and you say these people are going to this area, to that area. So you create a matrix. So you, you, everything has human state is state. And uh, during an earthquake, we live in the world of transient. Exactly. Do we ever reach equilibrium? Who knows? <laughs> A couple I don't of months. Think so I'm not in the equilibrium during an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you. But, so, but this is the first step, and I think it's a very good approach. Okay. You yeah. mentioned two approaches to improve the efficiency of standard in the mm -hmm. They imported something and uh, came in yeah. to ask you. Mm -hmm. So do you use these two appro approaches simultaneously? So you first uh, generate a sample by importing something, and then you Exactly, that's what we do. We first sample using important sampling, and then they do the data reduction on top of that. So that's how we get our own fifty maps. That's a good question. I have a comment. You know, we did uh, an exercise for the shake out mm -hmm. exercise, and it does a lot of uh, simulations on the effect of this 
earthquake which is virtual mm -hmm. on all kind of lifelines. Okay. And I think it would be a very valuable exercise for you to apply your technique okay. and compare to the actual uh, results which have been uh, given by uh, ShakeOut. Okay. The ShakeOut was done last year, I think. Yeah. Uh, and so it, uh, yeah, Trump was part of the ShakeOut, right? Yeah. But there were many other uh, networks which were uh, simulated. Okay. And uh, fires, water distribution systems, uh, uh, power, uh, and so on. Oil, uh, you know, the um, moving oil to the city. Right. So uh, that's something you you could just uh, take a crack at it. Absolutely. Straightforward homework for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea. Uh, so it would demonstrate the effect that you showed us, which I'm still puzzled by, why you end up with a long tail, which y y you show that you have a much delay in traffic uh, compared to the usual approach. So of I ignoring the uncertainty. Why you got such a big extension of delay? Oh, it's just due to the problem with observing larger ground motions, like when we consider uncertainties. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Uh, yes. yes. But um, variability <coughs> in, in routing. So when there's some, you have your reduced model of, say, the competition network, mm -hmm. and then there's some earthquake and there's some effect on each link and so forth. The, um, the routes that you would take if you started here and went there when there was no earthquake are probably different from the routes that you would choose if you had observed these delays. Mm -hmm. So included at all in it, uh, to an extent it is. So for the aggregated network, after the earthquake happens, we basically do the rerouting using the user, using the user equilibrium model. So basically the traffic now changes in direction to actually get there. So. You don't account for surface trips? Not, not yet. So you don't account for the, this diffusivity mm. traffic through uh, streets, right? So we would yeah, only look at the RV cross equilibrium the network mm -hmm. with severe links and you, you decrease capacity of various uh, uh, branches and you recompute your basically your equilibrium uh, and then you end up with a uh, time delay and so on. I'm correct. Yeah, but a couple of just now couple of comments. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so a couple of comments is one now with this efficient algorithm we could actually model the streets too. So, because we only have a 150 map, so potentially we could actually model the diffusivity effect through the streets. That would be a very good effect because I think we see that people are taking surface street doing earthquakes because the freeways is basically uh, lost the bridge or so on. Absolutely. I mean, that's the definitely something you could do. But one of the reasons why I mentioned this point here, how does damage in the actual network kind of translate to damage in the aggregated network, has to answer the second question. Is there any way we could take into account the diffusivity effect when we carry out this aggregated analysis? One thing we did here is to say, if a bridge collapsed, we actually didn't throw out the link. We reduced its capacity to like 50% because we wanted to account for the fact that people could go around it using those streets. But then 50%, 100%, we don't know that. So I just want to work more on that to kind of come up with how do we actually model it. Okay, well, I think it's time to close the seminar, but before, I would like to thank you very much for your work. It's my pleasure. Thank you. 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 Thank you.